open here. So it's a revised version. So let's take a look at uh, what what it uh, talks about. So we mentioned that uh, Pranel and Glauvert from the two sides of the English Channel were working on how do I take the incompressible solutions that I can easily obtain using small disturbance theory or in a wind tunnel, very low speed wind tunnel, how do I scale it to a compressible flow, you know, subsonic flow. So as the Second World War was uh, approaching, this was the end of the First World War. During that period, there was a lot of interest in uh, flying faster, not just the military, but also civilian side. Okay. People wanted to go from the west coast to the east coast, for example, with fewer hops and to travel longer distances. Engines were getting better, airframes were getting more efficient, compressibility was being you know, kind of pushed to the limit. So they wanted to look at it. So the governing equation we talked about is the linearized uh, potential flow equation which was written in our, we derived it some time ago. It was written as 1 minus m infinity squared times the second derivative of phi with respect to x plus the second derivative of phi with respect to y equal to 0. The velocity potential is free stream velocity. This is the building block number 1 plus whatever the body is doing to it. Okay, the body is changing the flow field. So this is what we are solving for in this particular equation. All right? So we call this first term 1 minus m infinity squared as beta squared in our shorthand notation. Okay. So that governing equation looks like this. Okay. Now as far as the boundary conditions are concerned, strictly speaking we should be applying the boundary condition on the body surface. So if you do that, you get a more accurate solution that was developed by Gothard. That's a 2D Gothard solution, which we will refer to later, not to confuse ourselves with the two, 3D Gothard solution you're using in your quiz, okay? But uh, in this theory, rather than applying the boundary condition at the actual body surface, it is applied along the x-axis, okay? So if the x-axis is y equal to 0. So any boundary condition on the upper side, it transferred to that point immediately underneath it, and that's where you apply it. Okay? Same way, if you have a point here, rather than applying the boundary condition here, you apply it right here. Therefore, the boundary condition is applied at y equal to 0 in this particular condition. So why can, how can we do that? We can do it if the body is very thin, small camber, small angle of attack. If it's a very fat cylindrical body or a sphere, obviously it's too far away, you know, thickness to chord ratio, we cannot apply it, okay? So this is a small distance approximation that Prandtl and Glover did it. So they said, I'm gonna solve this equation basically on a small slit, so now, x equal to 0 to x equal to chord, we use the upper surface boundary condition on the upper side of the slit, boundary condition, and you apply the lower surface boundary condition, boundary condition on the lower side of the slit. So think of this as a slit means a piece of paper cut, cut through, you know, tiny zero thickness hole has appeared in the space. So above the hole, you use the upper surface boundary condition. Below the use, hole, you use lower surface boundary condition. So this is what uh, Prandtl and Gabbard did. And assuming this problem could be solved, then you can uh, take a derivative of phi with respect to x, then you can get the surface pressure distribution all over the slit. Then the difference in the CP is the delta lift. You can integrate it to get the lift. You can integrate it to produce pitching moment. All kind of stuff can be done. So this was the idea. But they said, I don't know how to solve this compressibly, but I know how to solve it incompressibly. So I'm going to transform this into an incompressible problem. So they said, um, 
this is what we are after so that you can integrate it and get lift and pitching moment. Drag again cannot be gotten from this approach because it's an inviscid theory. D'Alembert's principle applies. So where should we apply the ta tangency boundary condition? Strictly speaking, we should apply it right here. So later on, Gothard came along and corrected it on the body surface. We will cover it a little bit later. But when Prandtl Glovert was developing it, they said rather than applying the boundary condition at the body surface, I'm going to apply the boundary condition at the slit itself. Therefore, when I say d phi dy equal to v infinity times dy dx, this is the body slope, free stream velocity, I'm going to apply it at y equal to zero rather than y at equal to actual body surface. The upper surface boundary condition is applied on the upper side of the slit. Lower surface was applied on the lower side of the slit. Okay. So this is the same picture. Rather than applying the boundary condition at point P, we will project the point P to this point. So that's where we will apply the boundary condition. Same way, rather than applying at some other point Q, we will project it up this way and then apply it on the lower side of the cut. So rather than y equal to y of x, we are going to play it y equal to 0. Okay. Now, this is what we, we are interested in. Our com com companies wanted Prandtl and the, on the British side, Glowert and Co. How can I scale what I know about incompressible flow to a compressible flow? Because they were interested in flying airplanes that fly at a high subsonic speeds. So they know how to solve this problem. How do I go from here to here, and how do I go back? You know, that was the question they wanted to ask. They realize everything is linear. This is a linear PDE, linear boundary condition, linear pressure. Therefore, any transformation can be simple, linear. We don't need something complicated. Okay? That was the logic. By the way, when you run a X file, it converts your compressible flow problem into an incompressible flow problem, transforms, solves it, then it transforms it back. AVL, when you check it for your homework number, your quiz number one, that's what it's doing. Okay. Uh, so we are using a transformation. So what type of transformation we should do? So we want to go from this equation to something like this, d squared phi d c squared plus d squared phi d eta squared where the phi is the disturbance potential in the incompressible flow problem. Compressible flow problem. incompressible plane, if you will, in that coordinate system. Then they notice that a y and y eta, if I, I can keep it the same because nothing good changed. So they said y equal to eta. But you cannot say c equal to x because you have here the beta squared on top of it. So basically they said c equal to x over beta. This is one type of transformation. Okay. Other way is you can bring this over here. So if you write it as d squared phi dx squared 1 over beta squared times d squared phi uh, d, d squared phi dy squared compare this equation to this equation, then I can say x equal to c, like I've shown there. You can say beta times y equal to eta, as we have shown there. Okay, this is the transformation they used. Okay. We need to check and make sure this works. So how about fees? It's a linear problem. So let's say I multiply this by some constant a, then a times phi can be taken inside the derivative. 
A times phi is what they call the big phi, okay, this phi. So that was also a simple linear transformation. We do not need to worry about the velocity, even though we know compressible flow is going to fly at a higher velocity compared to an incompressible flow because we are now never directly interested in dimensional quantities such as velocity. Everything is going to be divided by the velocity. So we are interested in the non-dimensional velocities. Velocity over velocity, boundary condition is velocity phi y divided by v infinity is a non-dimensional number. So they said, uh, I do not need to worry about velocity as far as the velocity is considered, incompressible flow and compressible flow have the same velocity for this purpose. Okay. Then um, what type of body should I choose? Prandtl and Glover said I am going to use the same body, same slope. That means every point here, whether it is a compressible flow or incompressible flow, I am going to match the slope. That means I am going to match the alpha, I am going to match the camber, I am going to match the th thickness. So if you are doing a 24, 12 here at 5 degree angle of attack, you would do a 24, 12 aerofoil at 5 degree angle of attack. Same aerofoil, same alpha, keep everything the same. Okay? So this is what they did. This works only when you apply the boundary condition at y equal to 0. Okay? If it was any other place, because of this transformation, beta times y equal to eta, things will change. Okay, so we will not have the same same aerofoil. That's where the Gothard's rule comes into play. But Prandtl and Gover said the aerofoil is the same, same slope, same camber, same alpha, same everything. So now we compare the governing equation from here. We want to work it back towards this one. Okay. So we are going to use uh, the transformation x equal to c, beta times y equal to eta. So this is the transformation we are going to use. So little phi will become 1 over constant times big phi, that phi. So the constant kind of carries along everywhere. Okay. d phi dx is d phi dx c times dx c dx 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 is 1, so that becomes just this number. Second derivative, you can again use the same way, y derivative, y derivative. You can do this step by step. I am going to do it in 3D, you know, on the whiteboard, so I will spare you some of the steps here. It can be shown that this equation will become this equation, which becomes this equation. So Prandtl and Glauert with a, a simple linear transformation were able to transform the governing equation from the compressible flow to an incompressible flow. So that's one down. Then they said, how about the boundary condition? And I'm really interested in surface pressure coefficient. What do I do? So the boundary condition is applied at y equal to zero in prandtl glauert rule. That means we are applying it along the slit, which is along the slit. So this is the compressible flow boundary condition. So again, uh, use a d, d, d phi dy is 1 over a times d in the incompressible flow d eta times d eta dy, which is 1 over beta. So I get, I get a, this as the d phi d eta. This is This is d phi d eta, same free stream velocity, same body slope. So if you do that, the boundary condition, if you compare this boundary condition with the boundary condition that we want to achieve, it follows that the beta should be equal to A. Okay, otherwise, we won't get the correct answer. Okay. So you apply the boundary condition in the incompressible flow transform it, replace phi with a 1 over a times capital phi, replace the y derivative with respect to eta derivative, so you get some expression uh, like this. 
compare that expression with incompressible flow boundary condition, then we find that beta equal to A, okay, that is the scaling factor. So, now finally, the C p distribution, so A is determined, C is x, eta is beta times y, C p distribution is minus 2 times d phi d x, replace the phi with the beta and then uh, x with c, then what you get is 1 over beta times d phi d c, v infinity 1, okay. So, v infinity equal to v infinity 1. So, we get the C p compressible flow equal to C p incompressible flow by beta, very simple. So, you could solve this in a wind tunnel or in a analytical method or a small disturbance theory. All you have to do is, if you know the beta, 1 minus square root of 1 minus m infinity squared, you can scale it to any compressible Mach number. Okay? So, this is what Prandtl and Glover came with. They never talked to each other because of the, all the political problems, language difficulties, coronavirus preventing them from traveling one place to the other, but both of them got the same solution. Basically, in a nutshell, for the same geometry at the same alpha, the incompressible CP and compressible CP are scaled by a very simple factor beta. Okay, this was it. How good how good does it work? Well, once if CP is the same, CL is integral of CP lower minus CP upper non-dimensionally integrate with X over C. So if CP scales that way, CL will also scale that way pitching moment will scale that way. So, everything is scaled by 1 over beta. Okay. So, how good is it? Okay. So, people have done a lot of test cases, a lot of experiments. So, this is what is, uh, uh, what is uh, known. This is from uh, this particular website. Okay. I, I got these pictures from. So, we are going to take a NACA 0012 at 0 angle of attack. It is a symmetric aerofoil. So, upper surface and lower surface are going to give you the same answer. So, I am going to plot the test data which is this rectangular square against incompressible flow which is a solid line and then the prandtl glover correction which is the dotted line. These are improved methods called Karman CN method. This is from the CFT like solution I mentioned to you, 1973 became available. At this very low Mach number, 1 minus m infinity squared is 1 minus 0 0.3 squared, which is square root of 0 0.91, which is 0 0.95. So, beta is very close to 1. So, incompressible flow solution and compressible flow solution, can you can barely see the difference, especially when the symbol is so big. Okay it is kind of hard to see. You can blow it up, then you can start seeing it. Now, you increase the Bach number. That means in a tunnel, let us say you are able to go faster at Mach 0.5. Now, incompressible flow solution and compressible flow solution start to deviate from each other. But what we find is the test data, which is the circle, and all these other theories, they fall right on top of each other. prandtl glover is pretty good. Now, dial up the wind tunnel speed, go to Mach 0.7. By the way, this we will talk about it. This is called a critical uh, CP at, the, at Mach 1. We will talk about it later. Now, we start seeing a lot of deviation between different methods. Okay. Some methods do better. Kalman C and extended a prandtl glover rule empirically. Their theory does better prandtl glover rule, which is the dotted line, is uh, somewhere here, you know, down in here. So, you could see, start seeing some differences. Let us dial up the Mach number even higher, go to Mach 0.8. This is what our transonic flight uh, 767, uh, Airbus, they are all flying. You get a shock wave in real world. prandtl glover says everything is scaled as an incompressible flow. It is totally invalid. 
So we can apply parental level true until transonic effects set in. After that, you have to go to numerics or test data. No, no shortcuts can be done. Okay. All right. Now there are other people who have developed uh, similarity rules. Juan Karman uh, was uh, from uh, Hungarian or Belgian. I've forgotten exactly where he is from. I, I used to know. Good classmate of mine, but anyways. Um, he was in Panel Glover's lab in Göttingen. They were like a nemesis. You know, they worked together, but they were also fighting with each other all the time. Okay. But um, uh, at the end of the Second World War, Juan Karman moved from Germany, like many of the engineers left, to come to other countries. He came to Caltech. And then he, there he developed this rule in partnership with the CN. Unfortunately, the Cold War was going on at the time in you know, Korea, in the Vietnam was just over the horizon. So a lot of the Chinese uh, scholars had to re return back to their country when they graduated and almost forced out of the, you know, whatever they could have done. And some people say that uh, this guy, Xi'an, was the father of the modern Chinese atomic bomb, you know, so such a Caltech educated person, and that must happen. So history plays in a weird way sometimes, but the only way we come to know these two folks is extension of Brandon Glover Tro. Okay. Lightone is another person. He also came up with that, another methodology. I'll just state them here without proving them. So basically in common C and rule, CP incompressible equal to CP, CP compressible equal to CP incompressible by beta. This is what the PG rule says, Brandon Glover rule you add an extra correction factor to get the common C and rule. So if you add this small extra correction, which is no more than millisecond on your calculator, on your program, on your MATLAB program, you get a much better answer at higher Mach numbers than plain parental cover rule alone will do. Okay. So that's common C and rule. Lightone's rule is uh, even more complicated, but not too many people use it. It's very commonly common CLA rule is used. Okay. So this is the Prandtl Glover tool that we developed. Okay. The next few pictures are from Anderson's textbook um, that we use in our undergraduate uh, courses. So we're looking at a NACA 4412 aerofoil at a fixed angle of attack alpha equal to 1.53 degrees. So we are taking one point on the aerofoil. This is a single point. And uh, we are slowly increasing the Mach number and seeing what happens to the CP. Okay. So the horizontal axis is we are slowly increasing the Mach number and we are looking at the CP value at a single point. Okay. Again, the circles are test data. These were done at the Langley Tunnel, which is a NASA Langley Research Center these days. Okay. So three curves are shown. This is our good old friend Prandtl Glover, which is just a one hour beta. You take the CP incompressible value, which is this number, divided by square root of one minus m infinity squared, you get this bottom curve. Okay. Light on curve gives uh, the upper curve, common C and rule gives much better answers. Okay. Up to onset of transonic flow, then you know everything falls apart. Okay. So transonic flow cannot be done but subsonic flow can be done with Prandtl Glover. You get fairly good answers. You get even better answers with common C and rule. Okay. So these are very simple numerical examples. If you know the incompressible pressure coefficient minus 0.3 in a wind tunnel, when you take an undergraduate course, they will take you to the wind tunnel. In our school, we have a lab called 3610 or 3051. You measure the pressure with the pressure manometer, you know, minus 0.3. All you have to do is divide it by beta, then you get the compressible value. This is another example. If you measure the incompressible lift coefficient with the force balance, all you have to do is divide it by beta to get the compressible value. Okay. So notice that you no longer get 2 pi, you get something higher than 2 